Did you know that we're running a convention? That's right. This September in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, we're running the Nerd and Tie Expo at the Plaza in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, September 23rd through 25th. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be all those things you always dreamt of but never dared ask about because you were too embarrassed. Or not. It'll just be a fun con. You should come. On this episode of Nerd and Tie, the voice of Admiral Akbar has passed away at age 93. We got a couple of Lego Batman trailers. Somebody wants the R-rated version of Batman vs. Superman to come to the theaters. We talk about the Thunderbird Hotel closing. Your Minicon has canceled their main convention. Nick and Trey both went to conventions this weekend, and they're going to talk about them. And we preview No Brand Con all along with reading your letters. This is Nerd and Tie. Woo-hoo. Yeah, we're here, and welcome to Nerd and Tie, the only podcast on the internet with a dress code. I am one of your three hosts, Professor Firsters, and along with me, as always, are the freshly married Nick Azumi. How's it going, everybody? And the forever alone Trey Dorn. I've been married for... I, 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 in June, I've been married for six years. I'm so sorry that you're just going to be sad and lonely your whole life. Um, (laughs) I have been married (laughs) since 2010. In December, uh, I will have been with my wife for 10 years. It's that spring fever that he's got, Nick. It's affecting his brain. I hate you so much for... So, you you know... (laughs) I, I I think that this last weekend we went to like the best convention I've been to for a long time. Oh my god, it was amazing. I'm jealous I, of you. Wedding con. Oh Wedding, wedding con. con. You were there. What? Wait, wait, wait. This is commentary has it already left the honeymoon period <laughs> that fast. Oh no. I didn't know we were referring <laughs> to my wedding as a con. We now. we were I referring mean, to fair. we were referring to your wedding, you know, the this one. <laughs> you know, the wedding that we all went to the, the, in that picture you look terrified and you're like why am I in this picture and me and Trey are just well, like we're, we're take so a better happy picture of me at the time, but... and, then, and then we said no this is perfect we said this is the photo this is the photo which I'm going to put up once more this is the photo we want to share with the world <laughs> <laughs> it's so good it's it's the very it's the perfect like uh, the gang goes to a wedding picture. Audio lis- <laughs> audio listeners, you'll just have to trust us and go to the website nerdandtie.com and, and I swear to God, every other picture of me from that day is better than this one. <laughs> <laughs> Literally every other picture. Oh. And uh, yeah, no, I actually. But- I mean, you you had a nice little dance off there too with Tall Katie, and I have that on video. I got what do you mean nice dance off? I got crushed. There, there wasn't anything good about that dance off tray. I got absolutely no, wrecked good for you. It was I would, I would, I would play some in this episode, except that the predominance of Michael Jackson would mean we wouldn't be able to, like, you know, play it. We'd get yeah. copyright flagged, and I don't want to get copyright flagged. Well, I mean, I heard, I heard Billy Jean start playing, and I'm like, oh, this seems as good a time as any to have a dance off with Tall Katie, <laughs> and and we rush into the dance hall, and um. And I didn't expect her to just start tearing me apart right away like she did. It <laughs> kind of took me completely off guard. So I had nothing to do. Uh, I, I had no. I had no response. I tried to throw out a couple of MJ moves, but I was. I, no, it was bad. You were shown well, up we, by the old fat guy with the trilby. Yeah, well, that's. We should uh, we should whoever that guy why was? It, why it felt like a con. Um, I believe the old. The older guy with the trilby was actually uh, the DJ, my dad's best uh, childhood best friend. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, that explains why he was there. Uh huh. <laughs> but he wasn't the DJ. The, there was the other so guy he, actually spinning. He and his son run a DJ company. Okay, so that oh. was his son. That explains in- so many things. So many questions <laughs> I had have now been answered. <laughs> yeah, they they run a. They, I actually had to rein them in a bit because he wanted to do all sorts of crazy stuff. But yeah, that was um, the reined in version. That was the <laughs> reined in version. Take a minute to appreciate that. Fur, we need um, to start DJing weddings. 
<laughs> we really should because I think I think at one point there was a text between us that said, "Why aren't we hosting this?" Yeah, I, um, we, 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 yeah. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, myself and uh, our and occasional uh, co-host of the show, Raina and Ascenti, uh, we got uh, actual real life married this last weekend, and that was really cool. Um, there was a uh, don't worry, nerds and Thai aficionados. Um, it was super geeky. Most of the our friends on the convention scene were there. Um, there was a card captor soccer theme, um, and uh, the outfits were really awesome. They were on point. Let's see if we I can, was great. You know, we have the technology. We could like show people. Show a picture, picture. I suppose. I if suppose I can, that's acceptable. If I can remember how to operate a phone. I just I was incredibly pleased with just just how I mean it was beautiful. I don't cry often, Nick, but your wedding made me cry. Oh, thank you. The, I was I was weeping a little bit. The uh, the ceremony was actually a modified Buddhist ceremony. Yeah, that Aww. that picture is up. That is so cute. Oh, there it is. I like that picture. That's one of my favorites. A good one. There's that, and then if I go into my camera. Fans of the second Cardcaptor Sakura movie will recognize the outfits. Then, but yeah, so. Nick's first dance. Oh, Aww. that was fun. Yeah, it was a really, it was a really fun ceremony. I'm glad both of you guys could make it, along with pretty much everyone else, because it was, it was a real heck of a shindig. I really had a good time. Yay. The the dinner was really good, too. Thank you for, for getting us dinner, Nick. Shout out to the Pontiac Center. They did a really good job. They were just a godsend, and they were really cooperative. I did have the, the, the of course, the impending problem of whenever I walk into a building like that and I would started laying out a convention in my mind <laughs> yeah, as to I how I would run you, a con but... there. But, oh, the curse of the con runner. Yeah, that's just something that seems to come with any time that you've been doing a lot of these kind of things. But you know what? Meh. Um, I was really, I'm really happy with the Pontiac Center. I look forward to doing. Maybe we'll do something with them again. Who knows? I actually know there's a small comic event that sometimes does use them for a space. So. Hmm. Very interesting. So, well, we've, but, um, we've, we've, we've been happy, but I think it's time to get something some good happened in Jamesville. With something, something good happened. Enough. You know, like, like I tweeted at you, Nick, I don't know why you're always complaining because that was the, like, that was not a bad, like half square mile of Jamesville that I spent all my time in. That wasn't, wasn't terrible. Um, I got the Boy Scout uh, cookies. Yeah. In a uh, blizzard. Un- Unfortunately, we do have, we, we, we do have some, Sad news uh, to start the show with, of course, uh, one of the most iconic characters in the Star Wars universe, probably one of the most iconic lines in the Star Wars universe was, it's a trap, uh, said by Admiral Akbar in uh, Return of the Jedi. Uh, of course, the voice of Akbar was uh, Eric Bowersfield, uh, and we are sad to report that uh, as, of, as of today, um, Eric uh, Bowersfield has passed away at the age of 93, of course. Uh, sharp, uh, sharp viewers, sharp listeners will will know that he managed to appear in Star Wars: The Force Awakens uh, in December uh, when that premiered. Uh, so he got to voice the character one last time. But uh, Eric Bowersfield, voice of Admiral Akbar, and also of uh, Bib Fortuna, uh, has passed away at the age of ninety three. It's uh. I was really sad about this, like sincerely sad. Yeah, because um, Return of the Jedi, I I make fun of that movie a lot, especially Admiral Akbar's lines because he's just the silly fish man thing. But <laughs> he makes that movie for me. You know, uh, the the congested sounding fish man is really what makes that final battle. That and Ian McDiarmid going good, um, and. <laughs> I mean, like, we're laughing, but, I mean, he really was a good actor, and he really make He is Return of the Jedi for me. So, yeah, I, I will miss him. Yeah. My standards for Jedi are not that high, I guess. The but, original I mean, it, cut is still very good. I, 
mm-hmm. I, I maintain. Um, the special edition ruined the pacing of the first act. Well, yeah. I mean, but the... that's, I mean, but, you know. And and the other thing, too, about it is that it's amazing how, how one little line can have such a huge impact on pop culture. I mean, even if you are one of the three people in this world that haven't seen Return of the Jedi, um, <laughs> you know that line, and you know all the all the jokes and whatnot and that, have, that have come from it. And it was and, it was my wife's OA name. That's true. That's I remember that. Does she still use that as a forum name on on like the uh, anything, uh, and anything? She uses it on my site. Uh, you know, honestly, I don't remember what. All of her, like most of her stuff, is like a mer- like reference. It some of her stuff still references that, and like her screen names. I actually have to think about it because, well, I follow my wife on all the social networks. I see the like the actual name, and then like the usernames in like smaller letters. So I don't know. Social network. But either, either way, like a very very cool, and you know, it's it's really cool that we got to see him uh, hear his voice one last time. Yeah, one last Force time, Awakens. yeah. Like, yeah. That was kind of neat. Like it was. I mean, he didn't play a huge role in the Force Awakens, um, but he was there in the in the war room uh, when they it was were good playing. Good to see the... Admiral Akbar alive and kicking. You know, he's he's still doing yeah. stuff. Well, yeah, I guess uh, rest in peace. Yeah, Eric Bowersfield shuffled off this mortal coil at the age of ninety-three. Not. But uh, we've got other other like uh, now we've, happier we've started stories? off. There, there are happier down. things to look at. We got lots of other happy and kind of bizarre stuff going out on on this show, and Nick's going to talk about it. Yeah, because this next one is both happy and bizarre, and it can be summed up with one of my favorite phrases: "Darkness, no parents." That's right. <laughs> That's right. Lego Batman, the movie, we finally have it, have two, not one, but two trailers. They're both completely stonking ridiculous. I love them. And uh, Will Arnett returning as Lego Batman after his phenomenal and hilarious performance in the Lego movie. Um, we basically are, I mean, these trailers gave, give us a little peek that Lego Batman's ego is still... Uh, the size of Ben Affleck, and I cannot wait to see what sort of adventures he gets into in the world of Legos. Oh dear! Like in in a time where DC movies aren't allowed to be fun, it's really nice to see Lego Batman is still doing whatever the heck it is he's doing. And, and that's what makes me excited about it because we just got Batman, v, you know, versus Superman, and which is which is a very dark film. And I'm just and happy a- that we're gonna finally get a Batman movie where I don't have to see pearls hitting a pavement. Yeah. <laughs> right. And by the way, and my wife points this out every time we ever see a Batman origin, that the pearl necklace, whenever the string breaks in that scene, all the pearls scatter everywhere. Except any like actually like real pearl necklace, like an expensive pearl necklace, would be individually knotted between each pearl. So actually, while you could break the necklace, the pearls would just literally fall as like one solid string. And every director who has ever put that scene on film knows nothing about pearl necklaces. I, I, I think it would be really funny, like, if, uh, like, knowing, especially the people who have done, like, if they wanted to copy the style from the previous Lego movies, if they set up like they were do- going to do the parent death scene, and then just have Will Arnett <laughs> be like, yeah, yeah, you know this part already. Moving forward. <laughs> Uh, Let's move on to Iron Well, they have him depressed about his parents <laughs> in the trailer, but they're just a painting, mm. as they should be. Oh, uh, I'd be. I, I'm now. Nick's got me really hope. Now Nick has my fingers crossed for uh for that exact scene. Actually, I really. But how like, do you do the pearls with Legos? Because it would just be uh, one piece. Well, that's the thing. You 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 wouldn't actually see the pearls sitting in the pavement. It would you would just start and like see the Lego family in the alleyway, and then just have Lego Batman be like, "Yeah, yeah, we've seen this already. Moving on." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just it's 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 gonna be a breath of fresh air just to be able to go to like a movie and have fun with Batman in it because 
I mean, like, even We're even not though... allowed to have fun with Batman anymore. Have you seen Gotham? No yeah. fun. No, no fun. And it's it's gonna. <laughs> I don't be know. I good. haven't seen Gotham since like episode three or four. It's well, getting... Mr. Freeze showed up, from what I understand, so uh, take that as you will. But this movie's going to be fun, it's going to be ridiculous, it's it's going to be just a really nice, laid-back, I can take my daughter to see this, and we're going to have a lot of fun, and she's not going to come out of it being like, Daddy, that was sad. Just anything featuring... How weird is it that we can't take kids to a Batman Superman so, movie? So when I saw Batman vs Superman at the drive-in, a bunch of people took their kids because they were thinking oh, it's a PG thirteen superhero movie. Oh jeez, I, I haven't it's, seen it yet, admittedly. But, but and I'll, you know, but I was like, I knew exactly how long that movie was, and I was like, none of these kids are going to make it through this movie. And that was before mm. I saw it, and before I like knew the structural problems with the film. <sighs> Oh, I did boy. a whole video about that. <laughs> but now there's going to be a movie coming out that parents can take their kids to see Batman. I'm, I'm so happy about the Lego Batman movies. It's like, I mean, I know we're not going to get them until 2017, but like, it's, it just looks like, like fun with Batman is so important to me because I grew up on the Adam West series. You know, when I was a kid, the Tim, you know, it, to, to point out how old I am, you guys can't say this, but I grew up in a world before Tim Burton's Batman movies. Mm. You know, so I was born the same year as Tim Burton's yeah, Batman. Yeah, both same. of you were. Um, so it's like I grew up with a very different, like with Batman. Batman to me was Adam West as a kid because you know, with Super Friends and with the original live action series. And he like, was in everything. Yeah, no, it's like, you know, meeting Scooby-Doo. <laughs> like, it was, like, <laughs> that's, he was Batman. Like, I, you know, it, like, but it was always, like, this this light-hearted, you know, like, yeah, he he was a detective, but he was, you know, like, like they made jokes. There were jokes! Mm-hmm. So, like, the idea for them to, to go to, you know, like, I I understand people like a darker Batman, and I love but, Batman Begins, and you know I'll even say this like we're we'll, we're gonna talk about Batman vs Superman in a minute on a different story, but like I even like I really really enjoy Ben Affleck's Batman, I really like it, but it doesn't change the fact that we've been getting variations on the grim we've gotten variations on grim dark Batman. And then uh, the Batman, like, we've gotten not grimdark versions in the cartoons, but in film, in live action, we've only gotten grimdark. Yeah, and, and, and even in the cartoons, like, the the re- the best example of not grimdark Batman got canceled. Yeah. Because people wanted grimdark Batman. Yeah. Looking at you, Brave and the Bold, one yeah. of the best cartoons. Although, I'll say, like, my favorite cartoon of Batman is going to be Batman the Animated Series from the 90s. Oh, yeah. And... He was that was serious Batman, but not grimdark Batman, mm-hmm. which I think is a that really show good had balance. Jokes. Yeah, that show had like, jokes all the time. That had a it was like that. That really Batman cracks show. a smile, but he's you know, but he's not goofy. But so that's why you know. But I'm I'm all for completely goofy Batman on film. Like I am all for the dumbest goofiest craziest version of batman you can find as because i need a like i need the pendulum to swing all the way like so may, we got may i recommend adam from west dc on, comics um adam west, up batman 66 versus man from uncle because well, that's a book and it's awesome anything involving <laughs> batman 66 is brilliant because it's the adam west version of the character well now it's him teaming up with napoleon solo and Ilya kuryakin and it's <laughs> awesome <laughs> <sighs> I'm not even kidding. This is an actual book, and it's great. But yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> not all DC things are this happy. No, no. Um, and speaking of films that, uh, while commercially successful enough, uh, weren't as <sighs> great as people thought. Uh, I like the Man from Uncle uh, movie. By the way, I, I liked that movie too. Yeah, it was good. It was I stylish. saw it twice. That was my it second was... favorite movie of last year, actually. But uh, I, I was using, I was, I was being critical of it to try to pull off a segue to Batman versus Superman, which was a thing. And uh, we again, sixty-nine percent drop. If if you want my 
full opinion on Batman versus Superman. Um, and a mostly spoiler free review. Um, there's some stuff that I did spoil in there, but not the big one, not the big stuff. You can go back to the last episode of the off week where I, I reviewed Batman versus Superman, but you know, people, people, both the people who like Batman versus Superman and people who don't like Batman versus Superman both seem to have, like, there, there are a couple of things that everyone has always seemed to agree on, whether they liked the film or didn't like the film. And that is that Ben Affleck was a really good Batman. Mm -hmm. One, uh, Wonder Woman was awesome in the movie. And those are, those are, and, you know, Henry Cavill did the best with the material he had. Mm. So, the, the, but you know, nothing wrong with his performance. Just something. No, there was never anything wrong with his performance in Man of Steel. It was right, right. <laughs> and we can. But and so those are the those are the high points that people agree on. And then the the one negative thing that even people who like the movie usually agree on is that the film was too long. At two and a half hours, there are just long periods that go get slow. My wife was bored during that movie. And I've never seen her bored during a superhero movie in my life. And we've seen a bunch of them together. But even though most of us thought, movie's kind of long. Movie's a little too long. We all know that there's an R-rated cut coming that's like a half hour longer. Oh boy! Now... R-rated Superman. Yay. And from what I can tell, everything that was cut was Batman, so it... Okay. Um... That does that doesn't make it better. <laughs> no, it makes it worse because uh, I've got a whole other things that I could explain. But the point is, is that and while maybe having a longer version on home video that you can pause and like stop and then watch the rest later, you know, like when you watch the uh, Lord of the Rings extended versions and you use We're, uh, that uh, DVD split <laughs> between the two halves of the movie, is today I'm going to watch disc one, tomorrow I'm going to watch disc two. Like you could. Well, I'm not the only person who does that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figure the books, the, 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 as like the books are split into six books. Mm -hmm. So, you know, works out. But anyways, well, that makes sense. And I can understand why someone would want that on Blu-ray or DVD where you can stop it and then come back to it another day. Uh, someone calling himself Bruce Wayne has started uh, a, a change.org <laughs> petition <laughs> to try to get... Uh, Warner Brothers to, to release the R-rated version of the film in the theaters. And it right now, out of the uh, 7,500 signatures they're trying to get, they've got 5,489. That means there are 5,489 people who want to create the most cinematically boring experience for humanity. What a, what a jerk. Oh, my God. Like, Maybe I, if we I, brought back intermissions, you know, like where it's... Well, you know, when I saw the Kenneth Branagh Hamlet in the theater, that had an intermission. Oh, well, yeah, it has to. The movie's like four <laughs> hours long. Five hours long. But, uh... And it's not even the best Hamlet. It's pretty good, though. Not the best, but it's all right. I, mean, he's I okay. like it. I like, I like the Kenneth Branagh Hamlet. Anyways... <laughs> Before we get into a conversation about Different Shakespeare, discussion. yeah, Trey, we're not we're not going there, buddy. I like the German TV. I've got my, sorry, so no, I, I did my, I did my nerd reference, but actually, it's with the snob reference. Yes, I believe that you know, and uh, debating Shakespeare. Keep going um, on. You know what's not Shakespeare though? Batman versus Superman. <laughs> that is not Shakespeare. That is say brevity is the source of wit. You can cut an hour out of Batman vs. Superman and it would be a better movie. No new hey, footage I, needed. I think it speaks volumes that, like, the DC animated movies are usually an hour at tops, hour and a half long, and they have, like, a zillion characters in them, and those never... I mean, those sometimes have pacing problems, too, but, like... They would tell a complete cohesive story where you don't feel like you need to cut things. Well, it's like, okay, so, I mean, this is the thing, like, this is what I'm going to say about Batman versus Superman, is it's not the worst movie I've seen by far. It is not a good movie, but it's not like, I'm, I'm not going to, like, this isn't like a world where there are, like, 
it's not black and white. There are good movies and bad movies and never the twain shall meet. This is a movie which is a solid D plus. Like it got okay. it got like sixty nine percent. Good. Like and it was so it's like it's you know, here's the thing with Zack Snyder is besides the fact that his Randian objectivism uh, focus doesn't allow him to actually enjoy Superman and therefore fundamentally doesn't understand the character, when he made Man of Steel like, I never got bored. Like, I felt like he fundamentally misunderstood Superman, but I was entertained while I watched the movie. Right? right. You know, it's like, I watched that movie and I had fun, but I said that was a terrible version of Superman. But, <laughs> you know, I I enjoyed the, you know, $9 I spent on worth of movie that I saw, and it looked pretty cool, and I wasn't bored. And, mm-hmm. you know... It's like he took that kind of mentality oh, when he made Batman vs. Superman only said, how can I make this less interesting? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, he, it's, it's like um, he had... Okay, so Zack Snyder is brilliant at composing the perfect visual frame, but he doesn't right. know how to connect those visual frames to each other. There's a shot in the trailer of Superman hovering over a house in a flood, Right. We have all seen that mm. shot, and it makes no sense. Um, you see, he's trying to emulate a comic panel where you would see that. Only the reality of the comic is that Superman is in that context of the scene in the comic moving towards them. It's just that because comics are inherently still images that you can frame him in the perfect kind of messianic way. When you translate that to film, which is moving, and you have Superman pause and hold there for you so you can create that same image for the audience to dwell on, you break the logic of the film. (laughs) It's so... I will say that, like, it's... what's, What's amazing to me, though, is that this film... He does get Batman right, mostly, you know, and Ben Affleck is phenomenal in his performance, and I'll argue that Ben Affleck is the best Batman we've ever gotten on screen. I'm saying it. I hear he murders people, though. Like, he does a lot of people murdering. Okay, so most of that's in a dream sequence. Okay. (laughs) And then there's a little bit, but it's a much smaller body count than any of Tim Burton's movies. Okay. Like, yes, the Batwing has machine guns. But you know what Batwing also had machine guns? Tim Burton's. My God, like, watch the Tim Burton movies, which are supposedly, like... And, oh, my God, Batman just, like... He puts a... Batman returns, he puts a bomb in the belt of the henchman and kicks him down, like... And the guy literally explodes. (laughs) Yeah. But, but also, I want to point out that... uh, Zack Snyder also was purposely adapting the Dark Knight Returns Batman, who d- doesn't have a problem with killing. So he was specifically going for, like, I mean, and, like, he, he's wearing the most comics-accurate costume for that in the universe. Right. No, so, no, I, I, I like, recognized it as soon as we first saw it. Yeah. That's so, what I've been calling him Frank Miller Batman every time right. I see him. He is, he's like the, he's like the first Dark Knight Returns when Frank Miller Batman was cool. Mm-hmm. It's actually, I feel like more like he's Batman like 10 years before the Dark Knight Returns. So older than the comics version, but younger than that. Okay. So he's that middle step on the way to that. So actually, that's why I don't have, I don't have a problem with Ben Affleck's Batman occasionally killing because that is a valid interpret. It's a, if we were doing any other universe of Batman, like I'm sick of this Batman but it is a classic version of the character, so... Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. So, I gotcha. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, so even though we've inadvertently ended up doing a little review of Batman vs. Superman here because some bozo <laughs> wants to get the extended cut in theaters... And by the name of Bruce Wayne, what Calling a jerk. Calling yourself Bruce Wayne, because what kind of dick is afraid to put his name on his own change.org petition? <laughs> I'm sorry. Like it's There's it's not like hours. you're an activist. Like like I understand people afraid to put their names on like on petitions that could put themselves in actual danger. 
like mm-hmm. you know petitioning a corrupt state or like fighting against some injustice but like i'm pretty sure this is a white dude asking warner brothers to put a movie out <laughs> like you just a dick for doing that man but yeah no don't it, it, we're gonna get it on DVD. It's coming out on DVD. Blu-ray, man. Blu-ray, we're man. It, Crystal no clear, what. man. HD. I'm sure it'll come out in 4K somewhere. If there's a 4K format available of something, I don't know. Anybody have a 4K TV? I'm sure somebody does. Netflix has content for it. <sighs> YouTube They're has just content not our for listeners. It. Our listeners Speak. are too smart to buy a 4K TV because they understand that the human eye only works so well. And if you're 20 feet away, or not 20 feet away, if, if you're 20 feet away, you're too rich and you have a room too big to be our listener. But if you're 10 feet away from TV, you can't fucking tell. If, now, speaking of things that have a legacy that have come crashing down horribly <laughs> in the past, past two weeks, um, uh, Several uh, w- several conventions were notified um, on March twenty third, two thousand and sixteen, that they were losing their con hotel. Now, this is not the first time this has happened in the con scene. We saw it most famously with Daisho Con losing their hotel. Well, in the uh, Wisconsin con weeks, scene, we we three, we these days have listeners from all over the place. For yes, uh, Daisho Con is a Wisconsin convention which was long held in Stevens Point uh, at the Ramada. Uh, they lost their con hotel three weeks before their convention. They all got called and said, sorry, the hotel is closing down. You don't have a home. Well, that has happened to numerous conventions in Minnesota. Now that the famous or perhaps infamous (laughs) Ramada Thunderbird by the mall, by the mall of America has been bought by the city of Bloomington and is going to be demolished. After about yeah. 60 days. Yeah, it was officially uh, the Ramada Minneapolis Airport, but everybody knew it by its old name, the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird. Because if Which, you can call a, a place... Name. If you can call... if You're going to keep calling the place the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird. But, uh, of course, this is big because the Thunderbird was home originally to one of the most well-known anime conventions in, Mini- uh, in Minnesota, Anime Detour. That was its that first... That historic first home, yeah. Um, which has, which honestly, Detour helped launch a lot of other anime conventions in the in the state of Minnesota and the surrounding area. Um, but it was home to conventions uh, like uh, Crypticon, Anime Fusion, 2 D Con, um, MLP MSP, else? which is the My Little Pony convention, which was like the weekend is like one weekend off of 2 D Con. Um, uh, Tol- uh, and Tolcon, Tolcon, the, the those are the those are the five I know about. So and other small events scattered throughout the year, um, which of course are uh, 2D Con and uh, MLP MSP uh, are the ones that are coming up fast. Uh, were yep. informed on the 23rd of March that they no longer had a home, and uh, fortunately, it sounds like all of the conventions are are close, uh, either have or are close to acquiring uh, new homes for their conventions. 2D Con has relocated to the Double Tree. And uh, I think uh, MLP MSP is uh, gone to the Hyatt. So, so all these it sounds like and and other and the other ones, Tolcon, Crypticon, uh, Anime Fusion, they are months, 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 months away. Yeah, it's both both those two cons, two uh, D Con and MLP MSP, are both in June, and the hotel was closing. You know, not now. Huh. Right around, yeah, right around. They were told there. thirty to sixty days. We don't know, and then after that, it's going to get torn down sometime. We're not sure when. So, it's, but it uh, really sucks, though. I mean, I I like I've only been to that venue once, and I really liked it. And it's it wasn't ideal. like the it wasn't the ritziest venue for the convention. <laughs> it had it, it. My God, did it have issues? Um, but I'm not saying still, it was without issues. It just it, it mostly sucks because hotel. it mostly sucks because um that there wasn't advance notice. Like people weren't aware that this was a thing that could happen. Like I understand that the Thunderbird was not the most upkept facility that it was very dated. And it's in an area that the city of Bloomington, Minnesota wants to redevelop. 
And so I totally understand why long term the the hotel had to go. Like, and there are other convention facilities, obviously, in the Twin Cities that were able to take on these events. So it's not like there was nowhere to go. But the fact is that they were told uh, 2D Con. I know for a fact, knew that they lost their hotel before the staff of the hotel had been informed that it was going to close. Oh, geez. Because yes. the management found out and immediately informed people who had been booked, but they did it bef- but like they 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 informed people who had the, the convention space booked within like an hour or two of finding out themselves. Like so the the hotel management found out and then had to tell everyone and it hit the news before like it hit the local menace uh, twin cities news before the staff that they had time to inform the staff that it was it was going down and so it's that's really and this is this has also happened with the the ramada when that closed in stevens point you know half a dozen years ago that mm-hmm. like it's i always feel really bad for these the the staff of the hotel that has no clue like it, it really sounded like based on what uh what tootie con uh, said um, that the the staff that the management wasn't even aware that the there was a chance the building was going to go up for sale. Like there was just no foreknowledge of this, and so it it caught everybody by surprise. So yeah, like that's that's what's messed up to me. Like I feel like if that's like that's the sort of thing that's got to go out there, and it's not like it was being sold to a competitor. It's being it was sold to get. For the land to get torn down. Come to think of it, this just seems to be a pattern with Ramadas specifically. Um, well, I, I think that's the chain people go to before they die. No, um, no, I take well, that I back. Think, I think what's, I take I that back. The Plaza in Eau Claire, which is hosting Nerd and Tie Expo, was a Ramada at one point before it was. they changed the, before they decided to go independent. So, okay. and they've been I the Plaza for it, like ten years. I do think it's interesting that that right around that area, um, of course, right across the street uh, is the Mall of America, which has not one but two shiny new hotels now. Mm. Well, I think it's coincidental because it, well, I don't necessarily think that it's anything malevolent, but I think that they waited to try to buy the Thunderbird until there was enough hotel space in the area. Yeah, I mean, not that there's not mm. a lot of hotel space in that area. Right. Uh, MarsCon I mean, is held over at the Holiday Inn Express. That's like less than a mile away. I don't know. No, it's mm-hmm. the Crown, the Crown Plaza, I believe. Oh, they moved Mars hotels, Con. or did the hotel change yeah. names? I'm not sure. Maybe that's the case. Because when I went two years ago, it was still the Crown Plaza. No, wait. When I went two years ago, they were at the Double Tree. MarsCon was. Yeah. With wait. No. Okay, so they were at the so Convergence, were at the Convergence Hotel. Like two well, years that's the ago. Sheridan. Yeah, that's it. That's I, right. What, really, MarsCon moved to the to the Sheraton. Yeah, I think they moved to the, the where Convergence was. Huh? Because I had because yeah because we had a room party like where the Convergence room parties are. Weird. That's where KakoiCon was held. That was the worst con I ever went to. <laughs> so there's a reason that uh, that's that's the that's the that's the convention where a staffer offered me a controlled substance. Oh dear. Kokoi Khan dead because it deserved to be. Also known colloquially as Bukake Khan. Oh. <laughs> Kids, don't Google that. <laughs> I say this because I once that made that reference in front of in front of someone who then, without telling me that they didn't understand what the word was. Went to Google it. Save search off, I'd assume. And 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 my sister wouldn't talk to me for the rest of that Christmas. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Awesome. So um yeah, unfortunately <laughs> we uh rest in pieces Thunderbird Hotel. I mean it's like it wasn't that great hotel, but it is, it is kind of sad to lose a piece of history. You know, it's that's the whole thing is it's like you can't drive it's, by it's, it's and historical. say that's where I went to, you know, X convention, and that's where well, I. It's, it's where so many people went to their first convention. I know so many people that that Anime Eater was their first convention, and and have memories well, of that place. It's, it's and, how I feel whenever I drive by the UW Eau Claire campus and the old Davies is gone because that's where I ran. You know, my first convention was in that building. 
That was how. That's still how I feel when I go by gone. where the Ramada was in Stevens Point. And Detour's first hotel is gone. Have they torn down the humanities building at uh, UW Madison yet? Because, like, how many conventions can we think of where their first venue is now gone? Because I can think of a bunch now. Um. Wow. Yeah. I mean. I, we don't oh. really go to we don't. Uh, my first convention was at Anime Milwaukee uh, when they were at the Student Center. So, well, that's still there. I drove by, yeah, it's still there. But anytime I drive by, you know, you, you know, UW Milwaukee, I'm like, oh, I remember. Right, that. right. You get that feeling of like, oh, like so, I. I remember the terrible hotel we stayed in because someone was like, oh, we're gonna get a discount, and I was rooming with Angus Derb and Minda. These are these are all for those of you playing along at home. No brain con staffers. I had no idea who half those people were. Well, Derb's so. Derb's currently co-con director of of no, of brand. no brand con. The hell is a Derb? <laughs> Kyle Janky Yankee. Jank? DJ Dirty Ice. <laughs> DJ Dirty Ice, your brother from another mother. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I haven't I haven't apologized to our listeners for putting uh, the uh, that that podcast in our podcast feed. <laughs> Don't apologize. <laughs> Nerdstar EDM is the most. You know the music in that thing is just great, man. Check it out. Mm. All three and a half hours of it. Great for car rides. Three hours and 23 minutes, sorry. I'm, I'm, the I perfect to... time when you need a jam longer than Batman v Superman. I tried yes! To convince, I, I tried to convince the people... I, I tried to convince uh, Q and Bal Flanagan to listen to it on the way down to Janesville for your wedding, Nick, but they weren't having any of it. Well, you know, here's the thing. When I was... Uh, this last this weekend, when I was tabling at a con, I occasionally would... I have a little Bluetooth speaker and, like, would just start playing that oh to God. bother people. <laughs> oh, anyway, I, sorry. I, rest, rest in pieces, Thunderbird. Yes, as rest as it will be because they're tearing it down. Down, sad. Day. Speaking of of resting in peace, uh, see what I did there? Oh boy! Over the last couple of months, we've been following the story of your minicon, and it's slow, slow. Eventual dissolve into fizz. All right, so your minicon, which uh, after melted away into a dew, your minicon, which uh, they they ran their first event in Connecticut, uh, not this year but the la- the year before, decided they were going to massively expand <clears throat> from one convention to twelve. Then. After running, they did run their second one in in Connecticut. They started to cancel shows. First, they canceled six of their shows, including Your Minicon Wisconsin and Your Minicon Ohio and Nevada. No, well, I'm sorry, that might have been the second batch. But then, like after canceling those first six, they canceled another four, leaving them with just the the main. And the Connecticut show, which they already did this year, because it's in mm-hmm. January. And now, the saga continues, as Earth your ends. Minicon has now officially canceled their main, with an E, <laughs> convention. <laughs> well, I it's important, it. because if Connecticut's considered their flagship con, that would be their main without an E. Your Minicon, um, yeah, it's... Uh, God, what a mess. Your what Minicon a, officially canceled. Absolute mess. Yeah, oh my god. Well, okay, so... This has not been a happy time for them. So what happened was, according to them, that... Like... this, They canceled it on March 18th, but we didn't catch it right away. Um, so so we apologize for, for not following close enough. They had some... According to them, they had some issue with with the the guest, where they were going through a third party agent, and then they couldn't like something with their agreement there fell apart, and then they were trying to yeah. contact guests and get them together. I don't know. Have an answer for everything. It's uh, but in the end, they decided to cancel the whole freaking thing. They said they're going to refund people. Um, 
Who knows when that's going to happen. Um, mm. With the previous shows, they did refund most artists. Last I checked, there is still one artist who has not gotten her refund from your Minicon Wisconsin. But everyone else seems to have. Uh, I will say that uh, I know that there are actually some issues where guests who are supposed to have gotten certain guarantees... Uh, from the canceled shows, still haven't gotten paid also. Although those mm. people are kind of going to be the last on the list um, to, to get money. Because um, you can't pay people money that you never had. Um, but, yeah. Uh, this whole thing was a thing, man. This has been a wild ride. In theory, your mini Connecticut still exists, but the weirdest thing about all of this is I understand canceling some of the shows from low pricket, low low ticket pre sales, but mm -hmm. they canceled the main con because uh, they didn't have enough pre sale tickets, like not enough pre registrations, and like these cons didn't fail technically because they never happened. You know, it's, and, like, I understand canceling a lot of the events, but, like, with this, like, you have to, to some degree, take a risk. A lot of people aren't going to pre-register for mm -hmm. a first-year con. They're going to wait and register at the door, because they're still deciding. And, six, well, also, they canceled it 63 days out. Do you know how many pre-registrants, like, you get, like, 30 that days before a con? Alone. Or even that last two weeks alone. That's why you extend yeah. pre-registration by a week, usually. Shut up, don't tell the secret. <laughs> don't tell the secret. <laughs> it's okay. It, I mean, that's why that's why you see boosts in pre-registration the last week, two weeks, because people are like, "Oh yeah, I better get on that," and then they do it. So, I mean, like, yeah, if you get if you're like twelve days away from your convention and people still aren't pre-registering, then that might be an issue. But I mean, you've got time. Right, and so, yeah, but also, just... like, you just have to take the risk. Like, you can't know always. Like, and sometimes you're going to lose your pants. And maybe after having to refund all this stuff and lose deposits on events across the country, they're way too gun shy. But it's like your minicon didn't fail. Your minicon quit. Yeah, and and it's it's really foolish. Like they have these, they, they are not even taking the opportunities they clearly have and there's no there's no guarantee that they wouldn't have gotten some attendance and it, it also it can ruin your name when people are excited for a con for so long well, that's and the then thing. suddenly it cancels they yeah. needed they needed something to happen after they canceled 10 conventions like and i understand like canceling a lot of them because you know frankly the Nevada show was going to be a massive loss if that had happened. Like it, it was just mm -hmm. like based on what, what when I spoke to them back when they canceled uh, uh, the the four after they canceled six and they still had like this show left. Um, like they 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 expanded too too fast. Like they 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 went from one con to trying to do twelve. <laughs> like you can't just like run an additional eleven cons right out the bat like you can expand to that big but maybe you should Eventually. try maybe you should try con number two maybe three before going like awesome con when they tried when they experimented with expanding to more cities said hey we're gonna try to do two more cities and mm -hmm. it didn't work out but and they didn't lose their shirt and they didn't hurt their reputation you know what i mean it's awesome con out in dc is still doing fine because they tried to expand to Indianapolis and Milwaukee and they never got mm -hmm. to the Milwaukee show, but like they tried the Indianapolis show. Like they went for it and said, okay, they gave it a fair shot. They gave yeah. it a fair shot. And, um, their timing was bad there because Indianapolis went from like just Gen Con to like four more cons in one year. Uh, Ouch. Yeah, it was bad. Wizard World pulled out also after one year. Um, so there's only two of those, like, four cons are still there. Um, yeah, no, it's like... Mm -hmm. Your minicon, you should have tried to still do the main show. Um, also, I think, I think one you of the might. big mistakes that your minicon did is scheduled all of these really tightly together. 
Yeah, that was it too. You like, can't really do that in. You can't run East a show Coast. like. Well, no, it's. I think East Coast you can run shows geographic. Like I don't think it's the coast, but it's just like management wise. Like, mm. if you're trying to like, you have to think when you create a second convention while it's not completely doubling your workload, it's greatly increasing it. Mm. Um. So, it's it's close to doubling it. And yeah, if you go down the line, eventually it slows down. But like, you can't just like start working twice as hard or twelve times as hard. It's not going to happen. It's a bad idea. Yeah. Well, your mini con. I. The more I look at it, the more I just. And and your mini con. You know who that one artist is who you haven't paid back for the Wisconsin show. You know who they are. Pay them back. Give what is you are. Give them their what? money. Mm-hmm. Give them their money back. Don't make us run a story about that. Because <clears throat> artists need to make money. That's why they do these things. Oh, I've Anyways. gotten the most use out of that your mini con graphic. <laughs> Nick, you went somewhere annoying. this weekend, didn't you? Yeah, speaking other of than, not making money, other I kinda, than getting oh. married. <laughs> yeah, um, Nick got uh, married almost, and then immediately went to a convention. Yeah, uh, Raina and I That's immediately went down ever. to uh, Kuroshi Con in DeKalb, Illinois, our third year going. Um, and as per usual, the Kuroshi Con is held at uh, the Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, as I mentioned before. Um, and, uh... DeKalb, Illinois, not to be confused with DeKalb. Excuse me. I figure since I said Northern Illinois University, but yeah, anyway. Um, like I said, this is our third year going. I'm, I'm really sad to say this was probably my least favorite year I've ever gone. Um, there were a lot of... Because generally all I do there is, you know, I go there and I sell art. You know, I talk with people, I have fun, right? Right. Problem this year was that they expanded a lot of, like, well, they expanded their artist and vendor area, but it wasn't proportional to their attendees. So there were a lot of artists and a lot of vendors all competing for the same small pool of people with limited money. Well... They didn't even really advertise the show this year. Like the website, yeah, that, that was the weird part. Yeah, the website still has the 2015. Right now, the website still has the 2015 con information on it. Yeah, which is which is not good. And I'll tell you, their their vendor setup was so confusing in the fact that I received a vendor table confirmation email mm-hmm. uh, about a month ago. And you Except hadn't even signed up. I had never applied. I was a vendor in 2015. And it's true. I said I might be interested at the con last year. But because they moved their dates so dramatic, like I mean, it's only a few weeks, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, they've been, you know, the but they moved their dates to the same day of a convention that I had already committed to going to, which we're going to talk about afterwards. So, and I had already Again, committed they, to that other convention. Like they didn't advertise, which was a problem. Um, I only know that the con was happening because they tried to get me to vent there. Um, and which again was not what they needed. Cause again, they had way too many vendors and artists for such a small pool of people. Um, and to, Add insult to injury, they had a lot of people, but no map as to where vendors or artists went. It was first come, first serve for tables uh, on both the vendor and the artist side. Um, That's and, nuts. Yeah, uh, especially when you consider that there were some vendors, and I know one, at least one artist for sure, that bought two tables, and if you don't have that mapped out ahead of time, if there aren't two tables next to each other when you get there, I guess you're out of luck. <laughs> I, I, oh, that's unfortunate. I am completely opposed to... I, I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to not having things mapped out. I've been to cons that have done this. I've been to bigger cons that have done this, but really? it's never okay. 
uh, Kitsune, I don't think has ever, every year that, uh, from what I've been told, uh, I don't know about this year, but last year and the years before, Kitsune has had first come, first serve for their tables. Wow. Yeah. It's... Well, I mean, Not, like, that's just like, bad stuff. room management because you want to, like, when you lay out a vendor room, you want to move things around so you don't have clusters and you want to mm. vary things so, like, like there are some there are some items that people will buy, like some vendors who buy things, like, will sell things that people will just quickly grab and leave the table. And then there are other vendors who are going to have groups browsing and dwelling for long periods of time. So you want to, which will cause a cluster in your aisle, and you want to move those, like, not have those all together so they're varied and apart. So the traffic flows and also you sometimes don't want to put two vendors selling the exact same thing right next to each other or else they get angry and start throwing things at each other and yeah then, then you end up with a dead vendor and then you gotta go yeah. bury a body but, and but yeah like, so that was that was inconvenient there were some other things like, to I, the bottom of the swimming pool i i saw some bootlegs i saw uh, but uh, i haven't seen wayne mcleod for a few years um so, now, some of you might be thinking, all right, Nick, if you saw bootlegs, why didn't you report them? Well, I have no idea who the staff were. Um, I, I was told that the staff had uh, red name tags or something like that, but I couldn't see, like, if I'm looking for staff, I can't just ask everyone to show me their badge. And that's the thing. There were no staff shirts. There were no staff armbands. I had no idea who the staff were. That's when you become staff. As in, act as though you're in charge. I'm not I, kidding. Just do it. Works for me I, every time. Again, I, there wasn't anyone to order around, though, because I couldn't tell who was in charge. I literally have no idea who the staff were. Um, other than the person who took our money for the artist alley table, I had next to no interaction with the staff. That's the person you go get. I, yeah, no, I'd have no idea where she went after that. Oh, crap. So, see, like, when I was there, like, so I went to KuroshiCon last year, um, mm -hmm. with, with, you were there also. Yeah, we I were, was there. We were hanging out. It was awesome. And, but, like, there, they had a vendor head in the room, a whole show. Mm -hmm. And so, like, even though it's true they didn't have easily identifiable staff tags then, because there was a <clears> vendor <throat> head in the room the whole show, I always knew, I, I never learned her name, but that's the one to go to. Her, right there. Well, I, but that's the thing, uh, too, is that if they were in the room, it, it was harder to find them. Right, because last but, year's Kuroshi, it was a small room. This one, there were probably about a dozen or so artists... Well, and, and even like though the room was a mess six last or seven year, vendors. Yeah. even though the room was a mess last year, um, where they had to keep changing the layout, they had assigned tables. They just had mm -hmm. to fix them, and so I, you know, I knew who to go to because they took me to my table and told me, "Hi, I'm the vendor head. This is your table." And if no yeah. one's doing that, then what are you going to do? It's we like, were simply told first come, first serve for tables, which <sighs> yeah. Well, I feel like I feel like KuroshiCon this year, just based off of everything you've said and based on my experience uh, communicating with their staff ahead of time, because originally before I found out that it was a conflict for me, I, I wanted to go because I went, you know, last year and had fun. Okay, Same. so I mostly wanted to I, go I, so I, I could hang out with Nick. Um, <laughs> it's I'm like, not complaining. Yeah, about no. That. Um, that's why I do everything uh, is to hang out with someone. Um, like, the whole, like, the, it was fun, but it was, like, it was organized but mm -hmm. la last year. But this year, it's, like, I felt like, I feel like they didn't decide that they were going to actually have the convention until January. It, it definitely felt that way, because like, there was a, there was a distinct lack of organization all over. And it sucks, because, again, I loved KuroshiCon the last two years I went, and then this one just really and, sucked. Well, and that's, and this is, this is frustrating, because, you know, it's, I'm not even going to, like, I don't want to say it, it's definitely not because it's run by a college club. How do I know? Because I mm -hmm. used to, I created a convention run by a college club that, yes, that convention. So did I. That so, convention yeah. that I no longer work for 
uh, is is now run by an independent nonprofit that I am the former president of. For like its first, you know, quite a few years, it was run exclusively by a club until we got told by the university we had too much money in our accounts there, um, <laughs> and they wanted us off the <coughs> campus. But like, and that that's when you go form a nonprofit. But um, like, college students are capable of running good conventions. We both did it. Right? God, uh, Evercon demonstrates that middle school kids have run a good convention. Middle school kids can consistently run a good convention. Northern Illinois University, your anime club, needs to get their shit together. Okay? Like, seriously, man. What up? And yeah, the, I'm only speaking from that side of things. I imagine maybe the att- a lot of the attendees might have had more fun, but yeah, oh, for well, me, you it know, was here's just the a really thing, frustrating though. If you're an attendee experience. and you go into, if you're an attendee, you go into a massive vendor room like that with not enough people. You have a sh- ton of fun because besides the fact that there's all this variety and stuff you get to look at, all the vendors are so desperate to make any money back at that point that they're going to dis- severely discount stuff. Although, if I recall, tables are usually not that expensive. At the, yeah, the tables aren't that expensive there. That's true. It's yeah. just, yeah. Um, actually, that was another one. There was like a, one board game vendor was set up like literally like right next to another board game vendor, so that was awkward. Um, so that's just awkward because it's hard to tell where one vendor ends and another begins. Like, that's mm-hmm. also, that's the other secret to putting together a vendor room and why you put similar vendors apart. So attendees know who to give their money to. Mm-hmm. But wait, if it was first come, first serve, I blame the board game vendors. Yeah, they'll all admit Those guys that, are but bozos. Yeah. Well, he might have just I, I that side of the the vendor side of the room was pretty filled up, so it might have just been that that was the for, that was the uh, first come first serve still open space at that point. Because yeah, again, first come first serve. Oh man, that's weird. It's yeah, it's it's a terrible way of doing things. I don't understand, and I I again I've seen it in other conventions, but I hated it there too. So. <laughs> all right so all speak- conventions don't do that please so you know what you know where i was though this weekend to to move us forward <laughs> as we're an hour in is that i was where at, were you trey i was at the independent show in indianapolis slash hoosier con in indianapolis they're the same place i love it, that name yeah it's, I love that and name it's so it's much. who's your con w-h-o apostrophe s y-e-r Space con because it's it's run by Hoosier Gamers, the local gaming group. And okay, so Hoosier Con is its own thing, and then the Independent Show uh, merged with it uh, last year. Um, the Independent Show was just on Sunday, but Hoosier Con is a three day con, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But Hoosier okay. Con is a uh, free gaming convention in Indianapolis, held every spring, and it is amazing. It's amazing that it's free, like. Yeah, that's I would crazy. Like it it is it is like if you could go to walking into that place is like walking into a um I'd say like if you could go to No Brand Con 4 for free. Wow, okay. Like uh we're only with more gaming than that. <laughs> Like everything else that size, but an even bigger tabletop gaming section. Like that's cool. how that uh, huh. this this con is amazing, um, and it's amazing that it is free. It's because it's supported by members. The people who are members of the club pay membership dues, and so that's really what supports okay. the convention. Um, and people can they they accept donations and contributions and like vendors in the vendor room they pay money for their tables and so there's stuff that but for an attendee to go it is absolutely free 100 percent free you can go to a three day con every spring in Indianapolis for no money and it is the staff is super friendly everybody out there was nice um, it's just it's a really positive experience so I will say like if if you are anywhere near Indianapolis in the spring, go to Hoosier Con. Um, now, oh, what, now, I was Do there it. specifically for the Independent Show. The Independent Show is a 
uh, small press, independent public, like independent creator, like comics show that uh, meant to highlight local creators. Um, as I am a creator who lives within an hour, I was one of them. That makes you local. Yeah. Um, and local. so it's uh, yeah, no, but it's like it's like going into an artist alley only exclusively populated by people who do original comics and work like that. And that's it's, awesome. It's really cool. And it's really focused on also education and discussion. Every person who has a table there um, has like a list of things that like their chosen specialties they've chosen to list on their board. Um, like, you know, whether or not it's storyboarding or character design or like, you know, whatever they're, they're good at. So everyone walking up to the table knows that like, these are the things that this artist is like really knowledgeable about talking about. Like I wouldn't talk about like, you wouldn't want me to talk about watercolors. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I don't know anything about them, but I can talk to you about, you know, uh, digital backgrounds and you know, all of that stuff. Like I can go talk to you about 20 hours about that, but so all that. So, and also every artist at the spring show does two 20 minute demos where they go on a topic okay. and at their table so you just it's it's like a mini panel only you know it's every artist is going to give you information and talk about something at like like I had I did two demos one at 12:30 one at 3 um on character design. That's really cool. Yeah. And so it's uh it's run by Fidget Press this guy John Graham um yeah, it's uh he had been doing two a year. He's going to drop it down to just one a year where he's just going to do the spring show because uh the well mostly because uh the November show wasn't getting a lot of traffic and the hotel it was in is going out of business. So, but he oh. he knew oh. long before, you know, signing a contract for the room again, you know, cuz that's what a hotel smartly does. Is hey, we're going to not exist by the time your show would be there, so you know, don't sign a contract with us. So yeah, it's uh, so it's it it's sad to see the the November show go, but it's only ha I only get to do this once a year now. Um, but uh, I would say like it's it's a really fascinating thing, um, and the independent shows like one of the and so just independent show was awesome. Hoosier Con is phenomenal. If you are in Indianapolis next spring. Do this show. Go to Hoosier Con. Stay all three days. Go to the Independent Show on Sunday. Have an awesome time and be cool like me. Don't Sounds go to awesome. un, don't go to uncool shows like Nick. Go to cool oh. shows like hey, Trey. I want Karoshi Con to, to get their stuff back together because I like Karoshi I Con. I, I want, want it. Last year, back, last year we loved it, and so that's why I'm really disappointed mm -hmm. that it wasn't that great a show this year. So hopefully, Kuroshi Khan, get your crap back together, and and maybe if I come, it'll be a good show again. So put it on knows? a different weekend. <laughs> Don't put it on but, Hoosier Khan's weekend. Put it on a different weekend. <clears throat> but uh, in a in a one week or in a couple weekends, not this upcoming weekend when we upload the show, but April fifteenth through the seventeenth, gentlemen. We are going to be together in the Wisconsin Dells at No Brand Con for the first time in the Dells. And we are all doing sorts of really cool stuff that's happening. Of course, Trey and Nick can be found in the Artist Alley in their respective lo uh, their respective tables. I will be found uh, at the Nexpo table selling pre-registration. I was going to say, at some point, all three of us will be at different times at the Nerd and Tie Expo table the nerd and yeah. tie table which is not that far from registration no it not at all so you're going to be able to see us pretty much right when you walk in but uh, mm. not only that but we're going to be doing a lot of other cool stuff of course nerd and tie live is going to be at nine o'clock cool. on saturday night we are going to be joined by gen proc uh she's going to be doing really cool stuff and hanging out with us and talking yeah and you're going to get a panel of four people you can so yeah it's anybody who went to nerd and tie live last spring at no brand con it's, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the I'm same. It's going to be quite different, actually. It's going to be very different. It'll be, but it'll be late night. Man, what are you doing after that on Saturday night? I'm not doing a whole lot because I got to be up at like eight in the morning to be on the road to get home in time for work at one thirty in the afternoon. Well, then you know, you could make it a lot like last year. 
<laughs> no, I refuse to be. I refuse to do that again. Uh, I know how badly I'm ungodly hour of the morning. Drunk. All right, no. Um, is, is that what we're ta- popping into the schedule is to get me trashed before? No. Uh, but you, you, know, that, you know, besides Nerd and Tie Live at nine o'clock, at at eight o'clock in that room. If you're curious about how we do the show, or if you're interested in podcasting yourself, at eight p.m. Right before Nerd and Tie Live in that same room, we're doing podcasting on a budget. So how you can learn to make a show like this for like no money, and and no money's good. Even we don't have it. And uh, after the after Nerd and Tie Live, I'm doing my web comics A to Z because if you feel like learning about how to do a web comic at 10 p.m., I'm apparently the guy to go to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I expected that panel to be at like 3 in the afternoon, but it's at 10 at night, which is going to make it a very different panel. Late night comicking. Late night explaining about web hosting and how to design a diverse cast. And uh, the advantage, the, the, how, to, how to end a panel. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's going to be fun. I just don't know how much it's going to be the panel that I expected to be doing. Oh, boy. Fur, what um, else are you doing? Well, uh, myself at uh, eight, a cl- 8 o'clock. I think it's 8 o'clock. Let me look at my schedule I've got up here. At 8 o'clock on Friday night, uh, I will be joining Amy Quinlan, uh, producer for Otaku Tonight Productions, and a couple others probably, in a panel called Don't Eat the Mic, where we talk about how to... Uh, where we uh, write cosplay sketch, uh, cosplay contest sketches, how to perform, generally how to present yourself on stage, and, and what you can do to be the best performer you can be. There's going to be some good, talented people on that that, uh, that are going to be able to help you, help you do that kind of thing. Uh, then right afterwards at 9 o'clock in the No Mercy Room, I will be joined uh, by Brandon K., Sidney Staffel, Nick Izumi. Uh, Amber Rose and Miles Reed Labato uh, for one night stand up. It's an 18 plus stand up panel in the No Mercy Room. It's always a lot of fun. Everybody that's on it is incredibly talented. Also, I'm there. Um, not quite as incredibly talented as everybody else that's on the panel. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we always have a good time doing it, and everybody that goes typically has a very good time. Then at 6 o'clock on Saturday night, uh, it's the famous Whose Line Is It Anime panel, uh, and it's going to feature myself, Nick, Sydney, and Miles with Brandon K. hosting. So be sure to be there for all those times at No Brand Con for all the Otaku Tonight production stuff. Along with Nick being on that, he's also doing other stuff. Nick, what else are you doing at No Brand Con? Okay, following uh, that great stand-up panel that I'm going to be on with you guys, I am going to be joining my friend Eric to talk about live-action anime adaptations again. What time? So, um, immediately, I believe 9 o'clock Friday night. Okay. Um, immediately following one night stand-up. 10, 10 o'clock? That'd be 10 o'clock. Okay, 10 o'clock, excuse 10 o'clock. me. Wasn't <laughs> thinking straight. Yeah. Then at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday... Uh, you can swing by my panel, Mobile Suit Gundam, The Rise and Fall of the Zeon Reich, where I am going to be doing a alternate universe history panel about um, about uh, space Nazis. Yeah, space Nazis. And, yep, and why they deserve to be defeated by giant robots. Um, because they were space Nazis. Because they yeah, were I did your whole panel. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, see me use my uh, history degree for something, even if it is recounting a fake history project. Be there or be unaware of the consequences. Solid stuff. Uh, also, uh, when uh, when you swing by the Ineffective Carnivore booth, Archimise and I will be there, and we've got a cosplay project that I'm really proud of that we're uh, going that we've thrown together. So I won't tell you what it is, but I'll tell you it's cool. That sounds amazing. So, oh, yeah, find us. Whole thing's find on us. fire. No brand. Ah! Ah! We got mailbag, guys. more than anyone else. <laughs> we got mailbag! We got mailbag to get through. We got to hurry through this. We're way over on time tonight. We're not over on time, but we're in the window that 
We're in the window. We are we're in the in window. The window. If, let's if we go it. another 15 minutes, we go out the window. Okay, so we let's open this mailbag then. I'm opening it. I'm reaching in and I'm pulling out a letter from Langland. Yep. And Langland writes DC, it's subject DC Cardinal of Sadness. And the entire <laughs> first paragraph is a lot of Batman vs. Superman spoilers <laughs> that I'm not going to read. <laughs> that letter was so full of spoilers that uh, so, we're going to say, We love you, Langland. I love you, Langland. So I'm just going to read the last paragraph. And it says, I really want to see a DC cinematic universe. But I don't think WB really gives a rat's ass who directs it. And sadly, the crap movies that Snyder will make are going to make enough money to keep producing more crap DC movies in the future. So yes, the carnival you guys have talked about the last two years is indeed one of sadness. Anyways, I just want to confirm my opinion. The movie sucked. That's all, guys. Peace out. Okay, I want to say that uh, while I don't think... I'm not excited for the Justice League movie because Zack Snyder is still you know directing it. Um, I am excited for Wonder Woman. I'm excited for the Ben Affleck uh, directed Superman Superman, Batman, Ben Affleck directed Batman. I speak too fast. I screw up. Also, apparently, the director of Aquaman has been trying to hype up about how it's going to be a much lighter f film than Batman versus Superman. And then again, uh, he's also directing Robotech, apparently. So take that as you will. But but so far, <laughs> every director and every other person involved in the cinematic universe for Warner in the DCEU, the extended universe, uh, has been. Uh, pretty much trying to distance themselves from the darkness of Batman versus <laughs> Superman, with the exception of Ben Affleck. But that's fine because he's directing the only character who's supposed to be dark. Darkness, no parrot. Okay. Anyway. So, so that's the only. I am. I am. I am. I am. Uh, not looking forward to anything directed by Zack Snyder, but I'm looking forward to everything else that isn't. Uh, what he said. And then I've got, I have another letter from none other than Shameless Otaku that I, I don't, <laughs> I don't think this was addressed to us, though. <laughs> the, the subject is Denny's and Sledgehammers. Dear Archimise. <laughs> what did oh, I just say? man. Thank you for your letter. I found the movie Streets of Fire to be quite puzzling for <laughs> one simple reason. <laughs> the movie was trying... It's the greatest to letter we've ever gotten on this show. ...to teach us an important les life lesson <laughs> of how guns and motorcycles don't mix, hence the title, only to end with a sledgehammer fight at <laughs> the death. Really? This is the problem with movies today. Why can't we make 50s, 80s movies that uh, that gloss over trivial storytelling elements like acting, plot, realistic motivation without having to shove up the pro... Uh, and realistic motivation without having to sl shove the pro-sledgehammer agenda copyright down our throats? <laughs> it's so far frustrating. That being said, I would rate it 5 out of 5 and would watch it again. <laughs> On the second topic of Irish animu characters, I would like to say Kelty uh, Sturlson from <laughs> Now on to the most important question. Blue Thunder. Now, is this still the Archimise, or are we, are we allowed to... This is still the Archimise. Okay. I believe this is still the Archimise. In the world of military-grade Belize attack helicopters... We don't need a, a wedding. A, a we, don't we need a wedding speech we can rely on? Well, I for one think think so. Don't you? Anyway, who? Thank you for the letter. Be sure to tell your family hi. Till next time. <laughs> best regards. Your Cylon scum, shameless otaku esquire. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Well done. <laughs> what is going ah. Ah, Jonathan Frakes! What are you doing here? <laughs> it's bishy, Jonathan Frakes. Oh, man. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show, Mr. Frakes. Can you explain the end of Enterprise for us, sir? I think Marina Sirtis could help you with that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you... Now kiss. <laughs> Oh dear lord! These guys have been sitting behind me like every episode. This is this is the part where the show starts getting goofy. 
Okay, I think with that, it's time to let to, to <laughs> Vomit Hat Steve Challenge. Before it gets any weirder. Vomit Hat yeah. Steve yeah. Challenge. Vomit Hat Steve Challenge. Vomit Hat Steve Challenge. All right, for those of you who are unaware, because, yeah, see there, look, they're right there on the shelf behind me all the time, right next to Peach Ann. They've, they've been there this whole time. They've been there this whole time in front of the Vic 20, next to Peach Ann, and the C&D and the tie, and the Nerf gun. All right, so the Vomit Hat Steve Challenge, for those of you who are unaware, is every episode... I read a portion of a book, and the challenge to you is to guess what book it is. Why is it called the Vomit Hat Steve Challenge? Well, go listen to, like, episode three or something, and you'll figure it out. What do you get if you guess it right? Well, let me tell you. You get to have your name read aloud every regular episode of the show, not to be read on review specials. Also, you get your name listed on the website in the Hall of Awesome section. There are no other benefits. Taxes may apply. All right, so the current members of the Hall of Awesome are as follows. <gasps> Archimai Zero, Renan Nascenti, Cheesy McDammy, Krista, Slithery D, Shemless Otaku, The Random Ramblings, Van Korf, Van Capito, Chris Graham, Lily Soros, Paper Godzilla, Cavsy, and the Minnesota Librarians. Hmm. Oh, hmm. That's a good... At min- and a couple of those are on there twice. The Minnesota Librarians are scary good at this. Well, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, since no one has guessed the current book that I'm reading... I shall read another sentence from it. I have yet to pick the sentence. I have the book here out of camera, down below, because it would be dumb if I held it up to camera, because then you'd all know what book it was. And that defeats the point of the game. The back of Kavanaugh's neck began to tingle. Are you saying it did? If you know what book that's from, go to nerdandtie.com and click on the contact form and tell us. Or if you have anything else you'd like to tell us, dream of, speak of, do into the night without letting your neighbors find out, go there and write it down on the contact form and we might read it aloud here for the rest of the world to know what is wrong with you. Or if you want to write a letter to Archimize or Shameless Otaku, I guess you can do that, or too. Or anybody else, really. <laughs> We're happy to be the relay for all the conversations, think none of, of the conversations, and the worst of conversations. Think us as your nerdy podcast version of the Pony Express. Sure. We'll, Only we'll with send less out, dead out teenagers. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Significantly less dead teenagers than the real Pony Express. Less less arrow wounds. Uh, fewer arrow wounds. Fewer robberies right by now, anyway. white bandits trying to make it look like the Indians did it. Fewer exactly. arrow wounds until I finally pick a fight with Stephen Amell, which will end about the way Very you badly. Will you receive an arrow wound, mm-hmm. or will you wound the arrow? Now, trust me, I'm not going to win that fight. That's just a fight none spoilers. of us could win. That's... <laughs> Stephen Amell just has to flash his abs and I automatically lose. That game, that is... <laughs> I don't know. Damn. At that point. Battle lost. Don't we all, all right, win? Well, yeah, as Trey said, if you have anything to send us, let us know. We'll read it. We'll take care of all of that. And as always, you can subscribe to us on Twitcher, iTunes. I think we're on the Google Play Stitcher. store now. Stitcher. 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 Not Stitcher, Twitcher. Not I don't know what Twitcher is, but that's not a Twitcher thing. Twitcher is, is what I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> you subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Store. Do all that. Rate, review us, tell your friends. It's going to be neat. Tell your mother's and as friends. Tell your enemies. And as always, check us out at nerdandtie.com for all of your pop culture Who are you, Fur? I am prof- I am and always will be Professor Fur. I am and always be Trey Doran. Steal my crap. And I'm still Nick Izumi. And we'll ha- see y'all in a fortnight at No Brand Con. Have a great two weeks, everybody. Keep on sparking in the free world. What? What? Pop, pop. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, God, no. I have-